Folks, we're going to make a start tonight. Uh, it's good to see you all in the service this evening, this special communion service. For those who are joining us online for the first part of our meeting, for the preaching, we'd like to welcome you as well. And we do pray that the Lord will bless us as we meet together around his precious word this evening. Let us all unite our hearts together in prayer. And let's seek the Lord's face as we come into his presence tonight. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank thee and we praise thee tonight for the cross. We thank thee for the precious blood that the Lord Jesus Christ shed upon Calvary's middle tree in order to purchase our redemption. And O oh God, we pray tonight as we come to remember thy death and thine appointed way, this do in remembrance of me. We pray, Lord, that you would come and minister unto our hearts. We do thank Thee, Lord, and we praise Thee for the cup that reminds us of the precious blood, the bread that reminds us of the broken body. We thank Thee, Lord, for the sacrifice that You made upon the cross for our sins. And, O oh God, we just pray before we partake of these emblems tonight in remembrance of Thy death. We pray, Lord, that You would come and bless Your Word to our hearts this evening. We thank Thee for the Word of God that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And, O oh God, we pray this evening that You would draw us closer to Thyself. We thank Thee, Lord, for every head bowed in Your presence. We thank Thee, Lord, for so many gathered in God's house this evening. And we pray, Lord, that You would come and meet with us in a very special way. O oh God, we just pray in these days that You would send us a breath of revival and that You would move by your mighty power. So, Lord, we commit this service to thee. We pray, Lord, now that you would abide with us. Fill us each one afresh with thy gracious Holy Spirit. O oh God, we pray that as we meditate upon thy word just for a few moments, we ask thee, Lord, that you would remind us again what it costs for thee, the Holy One, to bear away our sins. For it's in Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. Please turn this evening to the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians. If you're familiar with the book of Galatians, you will know that one of the main themes running throughout this book is the cross. Indeed, the Apostle Paul speaks about the cross in every chapter of this book. Paul here, when he comes to fight against the false teaching of Judaism within the churches throughout Galatia, sets forth the glorious cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what is meant by this expression, the cross? You know, time and time again throughout the New Testament, this phrase, the cross, is mentioned. And even in the book of Galatians, we have it set forth. But what is meant by it? Well, this phrase, the cross, is an expression which contains the great fact and significance of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ upon Calvary. It is referring to the unique nature of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for sinners upon the middle tree on Golgotha's brow. It is a phrase that is declaring the great work of Christ's redemption for sinners. And there's another phrase which runs parallel to it, and that is the phrase, the blood. And of course, the blood is a phrase that is mentioned throughout the Word of God, both in the Old and the New Testament. These two phrases, the cross and the blood, are interchangeable terms. Both refer to Christ's death and to the great purpose and significance of that death. And while it is historically true that Jesus died upon a wooden cross or a wooden stake, when Paul uses this phrase, the cross, he is writing, in his writings, he is not thinking so much about the wooden structure that Christ died upon, but rather the work, the glorious work that Christ accomplished upon the cross for man's sins. Therefore, as we come this evening to consider the cross as it is set forth here in the book of Galatians, I want us to ask this question. 
What does the cross of Christ really mean to the child of God? You and I who are saved, you and I who are born again of the Spirit of God, what does the cross really mean to you and me? This work that Christ accomplished upon Calvary, what does it mean to us? Well, very simply, I want to leave a few thoughts with you just before we partake of the emblems tonight and remember the death of the Lord Jesus. These emblems, the wine and the bread, that reminds us of a body that was broken and blood that was shed for our sins. First of all, the cross means substitution to the child of God. Look at Galatians chapter 1 and look at the verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Underline the first part of the verse. Christ gave himself for our sins. On the cross, the Lord Jesus died for us, bearing away our sins in his own body upon the tree. Our sins, of course, had incurred the penalty of sin, which is death. The Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. But praise God, in order that we might not die eternally, the Son of God took our place and died in our room instead. He became the sinner's substitute. In other words, he died the just for the unjust. He bore our hell in his own body upon the tree. We're all so familiar with the great doctrine of Christ's substitutionary work upon Calvary's middle tree. Isn't it wonderful this evening as we're gathered in God's house? Thank God we can read our title clear to mansions in the sky because he took our place and he died in our room instead. We're all familiar with Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We had turned every one to his own way. But the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And we're reminded of what Paul said also in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And then Peter, in 1 Peter 2, verse 24, said, Who of his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Oh, thank God when we think of the cross tonight, when we remember the death of Christ upon the middle tree on Golgotha's brow, it reminds us that He became our substitute. He became our sin bearer. He died in our room instead. And thank God because He has died for us and shed His precious blood to redeem us, thank God we will never be lost in hell because He has purchased for us an eternal, everlasting redemption. So, very simply, the death of Christ, the cross of Christ, it means substitution to the child of God. Christ died for our sins. But there's something else I want you to notice. I want you to take a look at chapter 3 there of Galatians. And look with me there at the verse 13. And you will notice that the cross means redemption to the child of God. Look what it says in verse 13 of Galatians 3. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And then look at chapter 4 and verses 4 and 5 of Galatians. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. My, what tremendous verses we have here. On the cross, the Lord Jesus died to redeem us from the law, the curse of the law. He died to buy us back from the prison house of sin. And of course, He did this 
by the shedding of his precious, precious blood. You see, there is no redemption outside the blood of Christ. And that's what these verses that we have read are teaching us. What does this mean, redeemed from the curse of the law? Well, the law makes a demand upon us which we cannot meet. The law says to us, do this and you shall live, and if you don't do it, you will die. But because we have broken the law and are incapable of keeping the law, we are under the curse of the law. And so the Lord Jesus died for us in order to deliver us from this curse, to redeem us from this curse. No man is able, of course, to keep the law of God perfectly. Therefore, the law condemns us. And in the prison house of sin, we stand condemned before God. Only a Redeemer could deliver us from the curse of the law, and that Redeemer had to die upon the cross and buy us back with His precious blood. The price of our redemption was Christ's death upon the cross by blood shedding. It wasn't just enough that Christ had to die, but He had to die and shed His precious blood in order to save us and redeem us from the curse of the law. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, thank God for the redemption that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many years ago, at the close of a gospel service, a well-educated man came up to the minister, the preacher, and said, I don't see the need for the blood of Christ for salvation. I can be saved without believing in Christ's shed blood. The minister said, very well, how then do you propose to be saved? The educated man replied, by following Christ's example and living a good upright life. That is enough for any man, he said to the minister. The minister then said to him, very well, I am sure that you want to begin well. The Word of God tells us that Christ did no sin, neither was there guile found in his mouth. I suppose that you can say that of yourself. The man thought for a moment and then became embarrassed and said, well, I cannot say that exactly. I have sometimes sinned. In that case, the minister replied, you don't need an example, but you need a Savior. And the only way of salvation is by Christ's shed blood. It's not the truth. You and I cannot redeem ourselves. We cannot save ourselves by our good works because even our own righteousnesses are as filthy rags in God's sight because we have been born in sin and shape and in iniquity. And no matter how good a life we may seek to live upon this scene of time, it will never merit us God's wonderful and eternal salvation. No, because of sin, we need a Savior. We need a redemption. We need a day's man. And thank God that Savior, that Redeemer, that day's man is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ when He died and shed His precious blood upon the cross. That's why the Bible emphasizes the necessity of the blood. And that's why we need to be saved and are saved by the blood of Christ. Many years ago in the state of Alabama, an old preacher lay dying. He had preached for 50 years faithfully, and he had lived for God for many years even before that from he was saved, and he was a godly, godly man. And as he lay on his deathbed, his son, who also was a minister, knelt down beside him and said, Father, you have preached for 50 years and have done more good than any man I know. And the old man, turning to his son, said, Don't tell me about that now, son. Tell me about the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus will do for a dying man. And it's not the truth. You know, child of God, when you and I come to die, we'll not think about the good that we have done. We'll only think about what Christ has done for us. Because 
when we come to leave this scene of time, nothing but the blood of Jesus will do for a dying man. Oh, thank God this evening for redemption through the blood of Jesus. That is what the cross means to the child of God. Upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die, upon another's life, another's death, I stake my whole eternity. Thank God not only did the Lord Jesus shed His precious blood in order to redeem us, but He lived that perfect life when He walked upon this scene of time, for He knew no sin and did no sin, couldn't even think sin. He is and was the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, and because of who He is, and because of how He lived, and because of how He died, by shedding His precious blood, He has redeemed us for time and for all of God's eternity. Therefore, as we come to partake of the emblems tonight, these emblems, bread and wine, that remind us of the, the body that was broken, of the blood that was shed, let us remember afresh that on the cross He was our substitute he died in our room instead. On the cross, He paid the price of our redemption by shedding His precious blood. Oh, I pray this evening that we will again lift up our hearts and thank the Lord for all His mercy and goodness to us. There's another thought here in the book of Galatians. Thirdly, the cross means persecution to the child of God. Take a look at what it says there in chapter 5 of Galatians, in the verse 11. It says this, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet surf, suffer persecution? That is the offense of the cross. That is the offense of the cross ceased. Then is the offense of the cross ceased. And then take a look there also at chapter 6, and uh, the verse 12. And you'll read these words, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, then constrain you to be circumcised. They constrain you to be circumcised. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. On the cross, the Lord Jesus died a shameful death, and all those who follow Him will suffer persecution. Because the cross of Christ is an offense to the natural man, all who love it and preach it faithfully will suffer persecution in this world. In Hebrews chapter 11, we read these words concerning Moses. There are familiar words. Hebrews 11, verse 24 to 26. It says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Listen to it in verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. The truth is, all who will live godly in this world shall suffer persecution. They'll suffer the attack of the world and the attack of the devil. And of course, the devil is the great enemy of the child of God. And if we seek to live those holy lives upon this scene of time and live for the Lord and live for the cross and live seeking to spread the message of the gospel, then the devil will see to it that we will be persecuted for the gospel's sake. No man suffered more for the cause of Christ than Paul, and yet we are to rejoice in the cross. And of course, the apostle Paul rejoiced in the cross. Take a look there at Galatians 4, or Galatians 6, and the verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Paul glorified in the cross. Although he was persecuted and suffered much for the cause of Christ, because he stood up for the cross and preached the cross, he was persecuted for the cross. 
Peter in his epistle in 1 Peter 4 verse 15 and 16 said this, And let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. John Bradford was martyred on the 1st of July, 1555, for his faith. He was chaplain to King Edward VI and was one of the most popular preachers of his day. And he was driven out to Newgate to be burnt. And as he was driven out to Newgate, as he made his way from West London, he shouted continually, Christ for me, Christ for me, none but Christ for me. And he took a stand for the cross of Christ. And because he loved the Lord and because he preached that salvation alone was found in Jesus Christ alone, through faith alone, he was taken and he was martyred for his faith. What does the cross mean to the child of God? It means substitution. It means redemption. It means persecution. But it means something else. Take a look there with me at chapter 5 of Galatians again. And look with me there at verse 24. The cross means separation to the child of God. At least it ought to mean separation. Separation from the flesh, separation from the world. Look first of all at chapter 5 and verse 24. It says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And turn over to chapter 2, a chapter that we haven't looked at yet, and look at verse 20, and you'll read these words. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now, now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul's emphasizing here that we must, as Christians, live those holy lives the Bible says, indeed, God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. And of course, when we are saved, our lives are changed and transformed by the power of God. It's a life of separation as far as living for Christ is concerned, living separated from the world. Look at chapter 1 again in that verse 4, and look at the latter part. We'll read it all. Who give himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. My, if there's a day and age when you and I need to live for the Lord, it's this day and age in which we live today. But you know, in every generation, God's people had to be a separated people and were separated because of the cross, because of the work of redemption. Keep your hand there. Just turn over and in. We'll soon be finished. First John chapter 2. And here John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says this in verse 15, a verse that we all know so well. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Oh, I pray in these days that we will remember that we are a separated people, and as we come to partake of these emblems this evening, I pray that the Lord will reveal to us afresh what the cross means to us. And I pray that as we seek to live for the Lord in these days, that we'll never forget that the Lord has redeemed us for time and for eternity. So easy to remember that the cross means substitution and redemption, but you know, it also means separation and sometimes persecution for the child of God. But nevertheless, may we never be ashamed of the cross work of Christ. The Apostle Paul could say, for I am not ashamed, I am not ashamed of the gospel, not ashamed of the cross, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone 
that believeth. May God bless His Word tonight to every heart. And as we now partake of the emblems, may we remember afresh what it costs for Christ the Holy One to bear away our sin. And may we lift up our hearts again in praise and thanksgiving for all His mercy to us. Let us all pray. Father in heaven, we thank Thee and we praise Thee for all Thy goodness to us this night. O God, we thank Thee for redeeming us by Your precious blood and saving us for time and for eternity. How it blesses our hearts to know that we're on our way to heaven, not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ has accomplished on the cross for us. Bless every head bowed in Your presence tonight, Lord. And, O God, as we come now to partake, Lord, of these emblems that remind us of a body that was broken, of blood that was shed. And, Lord, we recognize that they're only emblems. We don't believe in transubstantiation. O God, we thank Thee that the Lord Jesus Christ has died, and died once only. And after His death, praise God, He ascended back to heaven, where He is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for His people. We praise the Lord that He made that once and for all never to be repeated sacrifice. And O oh God, we thank Thee that we can come however tonight and remember, remember His death. We thank the Lord that it's a, an act of remembrance tonight. O oh God, help us to lift up our hearts to Thee and bless us, Lord, now as we partake. In Jesus' precious, precious name we ask it. Amen.